again, welcome to Longer Tables. Well, thank you for the invitation. I'm very excited. I mean, for me, for me, it's a thrill to have you here. But every time I've seen you in the times we are in different parts of the world because conferences and other things, I always see that you have uh, a little friend next to you yes. that is always next to you. Can you tell me about him? Yep, his name is Mr. H. He's named after a man called Gary Horn, who went totally blind at 21 in the US Marines, decided to become a magician. People said, but Gary, you can't be a magician if you're blind. The children don't know he's blind. And at the end, he'll tell them and say, things may go wrong in your life, but if they do, don't give up. There's always a way forward. He's taught at me, he goes skydiving. Uh, he taught himself to paint. He thought he was giving me a stuffed chimpanzee 29 years ago for my birthday. And I made him hold the tail. I said, Gary, chimps don't have tails. He said, never mind, take him where you go and you know I'm with you in spirit. So he's been to 61 countries with me. 61 countries and has a tail, but also has, which I think is very appropriate for these <laughs> podcast, longer tables. He is eating a, a banana. Yes, and but this is a, is a magic banana because he eats it every night and every morning it's new again. It's a magic banana. You see, for the little ones that I know they are listening to this podcast, uh, now they know it's a magic banana. So you, they can eat their bananas every day and don't worry, next morning. Next morning it'll be right there, if it's magic. If it's magic. But remember, Gary Horn, who gave him to me, was a magician. Fascinating <laughs> story. It's fascinating. I think this can be the banana that will feed the world, if you believe in it. If you believe in it. Huh. Like the five little fishes and the two loaves. <laughs> yes, indeed. So here we love to talk in longer tables about, about food. We believe in sharing a long table, obviously, it brings people together, people that know each other, people that love each other. But very often happens that in these longer tables, these people don't know each other. Yeah. And the table and the food becomes what brings them together. And I think uh, all of that always begins when we are young. And, and the effect that growing up in a family with better food traditions or not so good food traditions, everybody seems always to have uh, fun food memories of their childhood. So you, you tell me what the, how you grow up eating in the post-war uh, Britain. Uh, uh, was your mama cook? Was was uh, I mean, for what I know, you still live in the in the house where your uh, grandma uh, 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 born. I mean, you born in the house. Uh, uh, you have memories of, of of food in the kitchen in your early days. I have very very fond memories. Uh, <clears throat> but before I went to live in the house where you're talking about, I stayed with my other grandmother, my paternal grandmother, and she had an old farmhouse. And what I remember there is the, the, the cook was making butter balls with these two pieces of wood and rolling the butter so that it had a little spotty pattern on it. I remember that so well. And collecting the hen's eggs so that we could eat them. Will you do that? You will go to collect the eggs? I went to collect the eggs. So the hens, mind you, were free. They were running around the way hens should. But they went into these little hen houses with nest boxes, and I was asking everybody, where is the hole on the hen big enough for that egg to come out because I couldn't see one? <laughs> and they never told me. So I saw a hen going into a hen house, and I went and saw how a hen lays an egg. So there you saw the question that everybody always says, what was first, the chicken or the egg? Definitely the chicken. <laughs> you you began finding in the very early years of your life the answers on your own. Yeah, I was four. But um, then, then from there, we moved to the house you're talking about. And that was at the beginning of the war. So I lived through wartime Britain when every food was rationed. When, if you know, there was only like a very tiny joint uh, which, which we had on Sunday. And then anything left over was made into mince. And we had, we had, I think it was two squares of chocolate a week. Uh, we had 
I mean, it was, it was unbelievable, the rationing, two eggs a week per person, that was it. And luckily we got food parcels from the colonies. Ours came from Australia because there were children in the house and it contained dried milk and dried egg powder. So I grew up on dried egg powder and hated eggs after that because so often they were runny and it made me feel sick because I wasn't used to that. You know, the little squiggly cords and oh my goodness. But my, my mother taught me if you go to stay with somebody you must put, be polite and eat the food they give you. So how many times I nearly died. <laughs> so butter bowls, uh, dry egg, uh, uh, eggs. Uh, what dishes you remember, if any, uh, cook with those ingredients? Anything that comes to mind? Just about everything. But my grandmother was the cook. My mother used to burn everything, so she was no good. But my grandmother was quite a good cook. And she managed to use these strange ingredients. She occasionally made a cake. And the one piece, one time she made a cake that I remember best was a Christmas cake. And her beloved son, who was a surgeon, was there from London. He was treating the people harmed in the Blitz of London by the Germans. And she said proudly, I've put everything in this cake. She'd been saving up for like a month for ingredients, you know, a few raisins. And at that moment, her son bite, bit on the cake and there was a piece of glass in it. So we never let her forget. You put everything in it, even glass. I think eggs is, is a great way to start cooking. I, I think the first thing I ever cooked as a young boy was, was use a cake, a simple recipe. Yeah, but you know, growing up in the war, I'm, I'm really glad I did that. I learned to take nothing for granted. So if a piece of food spilled on the floor, you didn't leave it, you didn't throw it away. You didn't waste anything. That was a very good way to grow up. My, my, my father and mother, very often when we didn't want to eat something, they would always tell me, well, in the, when we were young and, you know, post Civil War in Spain, it was not war, but post Civil War, Franco era, and it's not like, Every family had everything they wanted. They will always give me the example that you eat everything. Like exactly the same story you were telling me. And I think me, myself, made me um, to love and understand food better. Yeah, I agree. Absolutely. And, you know, even when the war ended in Britain, we still had rationing, food rationing, for at least a year, if not two. Because, you know, there was so little money and soldiers were coming back and there was a lot of poverty and suffering so you know if if uh, what has happened in ukraine and i wouldn't be there maybe i will be listening to you and i could maybe get a glimpse of so many years ago what what will be like but that said you could only you could only imagine it um, it's not like i've been through through hunger myself or in ukraine i had any issue but i've seen people uh, suffering because the horrors of war and because things like food that sometimes we take for granted. Yeah, that's it. People today take it for granted. But you spend time in Ukraine, people there, some of them must have been so hungry. Yeah, it's the, the power of food and the mayhem that war creates because at the end we are who we are uh, because what we eat. So I want to know more than about the fascinating early uh, life when you go and you arrive to Tanzania and 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 the people listening to us they they know who Yang Goodall is and 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 your life story and and all the impact that you have had but what keeps being fascinating to me obviously is you you arrive you are around 26 you are in Tanzania you want to study uh, to be part of ch uh, chimpanzees, and there you are in the camp. And what I'm very interested in is because everything else is in documentaries, and everybody knows about your life. But you remember what did you eat at that camp in the upon your arrival? What, what was life like in the camp, and what was the food like? Well, life was me and my mother sharing an ex-army tent, and we had one cook, 
because uh, they told us, you know, you can't go just you two women, you've got to have somebody, and they found this, this cook to go with us. And he was a wonderful cook, and he'd worked for the different British administrators in the nearby town, one after the other. But they all fired him because he loved any kind of alcohol he could get hold of. So they said, well, this will be perfect. Jane and her mother won't have alcohol. They'll have a wonderful cook, and he won't be able to drink. It took him two weeks to find a really potent brew made of fermented bananas. So, With fermented bananas? Yes. It's more like a liqueur, I suppose. But anyway, they call it pombe. And uh, so, <laughs> but anyway, we had mostly tins. And the British told us that there was a village at the end of the National Park. Uh, and they said, don't go there. It's full of really bad people. But I had met uh, one African who was going to <clears throat> initially show me my way around the mountain. And it was his village. And he took us there. They were wonderful people. I don't know what was wrong with the British. They said it was full of witch doctors, and there were witch doctors for sure. But so we managed to get there uh, some fresh food, little tiny hen's eggs they have there, because you know they're all half wild. And we could. It's get... always eggs somewhere. Yes, yes, still <laughs> Dry, eggs. Dry, fresh, Fra it's always eggs somewhere. But always hard eggs, not runny eggs. So... In, in a film, you. you... You were eating uh, uh, hanged baked Heinz beans, baked beans yes. out of the can. Uh, do you like them still today? Uh, I don't really eat baked beans anymore. But I remember the scene in that film because my my husband was filming, and he kept getting it wrong. And so there was this tin of baked beans, and on my plate was a, a fried egg. And he kept saying, we have to do it again. And so I was continually having to eat a spoonful of baked beans and cold egg. <laughs> but So you don't have good memories of that moment? Not that moment, but, you know, we, we had good vegetables from the village. We had the tins. And uh, so I didn't eat all day. I had a piece of toast. The cook made wonderful bread under a tin, the campfire. It was very simple. And so in the morning, I would eat a little piece of that and coffee from a thermos. And then I didn't eat all day. And I came down and the cook had made very simple meals, you know, but what he could with a few tins, potatoes, cabbage, that sort of thing. But I have to tell you that it reminded me before I ever got to Gombe in the camp, it was when there was these riots in the Belgian Congo, as it was then, and the town where we arrived was full of Belgian refugees. And so we volunteered to be among the people helping to feed them. They were in a huge sort of, it was a, a place where the, the Belgians stored food when it came over the lake from on boats. And mum and I were tasked every day with filling up tin trunks this size with Spam sandwiches. You remember Spam? I love Spam. Yes, I know, but, but that's all the poor refugees had. And very, very sweet tea that the Indians make with lots of milk and very little tea and lots of sugar. So you were a humanitarian cook. You know, not very far from here, 50 meters, is where Mrs. Clara Barton had her offices. Really? And even everybody remembers her as the nurse she was and creating the missing soldiers office and, and the American Red Cross. Uh, she also was part of, very often on feeding uh, missions. Yeah. I see that you were already at very early age a food humanitarian. It's fascinating. I didn't know that uh, about you. But then, um, how many hours will you say in a day you will spend observing the chimpanzees or searching in the distance them. searching for them i guess you spend no no hours but maybe days but then once you find weeks and then when you will find them uh, i mean these images of you being one with them being well, no, no, it wasn't quite like that it took um but the first four months and i only had money for six the first four months as soon as I got near them, they vanished into the undergrowth. They 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 went away from yeah, you. Yeah, they went away. 
and then one of them. And um, if I tell you, you remind me of him. I hope that doesn't insult you. Oh my, I called honor. him David Greybeard because he had a beautiful greybeard just like yours. He was my favorite chimp and he was very, very handsome. So he began to let me get closer. And one day I saw him, he was sitting on a termite mound, you know, white ants, and he was picking pieces of grass. He would make a scratch open one of the passages, put the grass down and pick off the termites with his lips. So he was using grass as a tool and he was even picking a leafy twig and before he could use that as a tool, he had to pick off the leaves. And so he was making a tool. And at that time, it was thought by scientists that humans and only humans use and make tools. So that was the turning point. National Geographic came in, said they would continue funding when my six months ran out. So when you see that he's using a tool to feed himself, you realize in that moment that what you were witnessing was life changing because was or proving theories or things nobody even imagined. That had to be a huge moment in your life to see that they were like us. Yes, and it was a <clears throat> it was the first time that I observed something which previously had been thought to be unique to humans. So it was the tool using. Uh, it was the fact they use medicinal plants. It was the fact that they uh, they have personalities. It used to be thought only humans had personalities, that they can solve problems, they're highly intelligent, and they have emotions, happiness, sadness, fear. But I don't know, do you have dogs? Um, no. Well, I have two, but they are, they are robots. Okay, well, I had a dog when I was growing up, and he taught me that animals have personalities, minds, and emotions. And so one by one, chimps proved that we are part of and not separate from the rest of the animal kingdom. It's just that we've evolved in a different direction. Fascinating. Uh, when uh, I was maybe eight, nine, was this fascinating man called Felix Rodriguez de la Fuente. And he's this man that had this uh, TV show where he will be in the wild. He began in Spain and spent time with different animals in different parts, not only of Spain, of the world. And the first thing that uh, I heard somebody describing an animal using a tool to feed uh, himself was a bird high up in the mountains called, in Spanish, quebrantahuesos. I don't know in English. Would it be Egyptian vulture? Like a vulture, very big. And he will get a rock, and he will use the rock yep. to hit against That's an right. egg to break an the egg. egg. Yes. And this for me was also fascinating. And I remember this man, Felix, like you are describing it to me, saying this is fascinating that the bird is using a tool to feed itself. Now we know lots of animals use tools. I mean, you know, octopus. You know the octopus? Uh, there's a picture, film, of one scurrying across the ocean floor and under, under each of two arms on each side there's a half coconut shell and she gets to a nice flat sandy place where she wants to hunt fish. She puts one half down, she creeps into it because they can make themselves very small then she reaches out a tentacle and pulls it over the top. All you see are her eyes looking out. And then, poof, a fish is caught. Obviously, the tool you were describing about the chimpanzee uh, to feed uh, themselves, but then uh, this, in a way, is cooking. He was used catching the, the ants and eating them raw. Anyway, I will catch an oyster and open it and eat it raw. I will you use... will, I won't. But, but I love voices, uh, but if I understand. So with this, I'm asking, then do the chimpanzees have a food culture well, like we do? Yes, they, they do, because in different parts of Africa where they're studied, they have different um, food traditions. 
and they vary from place to place. And the tools they use, like in West Africa, they use rocks to hammer open hard-shelled nuts. We have the same nuts in Gombe, but they, don't, they only eat the flesh and not the kernel. So there's many different uh, food cultures. One group uses a long stick to scoop up algae from a pond, long green strings, a bit like spaghetti, and <laughs> slurp it up. And there's all these different foods they eat. They eat them in one place, they're in the other, but they don't eat them. Fascinating. The, um, one of the things I saw, I read, was about how, how in a way, obviously, uh, if it's true that the chimpanzees, and I believe it's true, I'm more learning from you, that they have this culture is how they keep passing this information from generation to generation, like the human species has done, is we keep passing what we learn from, from centuries and centuries of uh, evolution. Uh, uh, do, do chimps, I read well, or, or I know well, uh, that they use foods as medicines themselves? Yes, they do. And they, interestingly, they use the same leaves or pieces of bark to cure, like if they get bad tummy, if they get worms, they use the same plant as the local people, which is really interesting. And, and who learn from whom? The humans learn I from don't. the chimps or the chimps learn I from don't the know. humans? That's what we'll never know, will we? Fascinating. But in this area, there's a lot of, there used to be a lot of witch doctors, and many of them were medicinal healers, really. They were called witch doctors, but they were, they were traditional healers, and they would prescribe this medicine. But if they were a bad witch doctor, they would prescribe something bad instead. So you, you spend time with the chimps, like, no many other people in the history uh, span. I mean, I grew up uh, watching movies of Tarzan, and here I am uh, with uh, a, a living legend that they spend time even eating with them. You're, re you're with the Jane that Tarzan should have married. <laughs> yes, yes indeed. But so, so tell me how is this moment, because this had to be a fascinating moment. I cannot even imagine what was going inside you when you are accepted into, into that family. Uh, and you are there, technically even living and eating with them. But what's that like? Well, not really, because I would watch them all day if I, if I could find them. Um, I would then go back. And at first, of course, my mother was there. So the cook would have this food and we'd sleep in this tent. Um, I never actually ate with the chimps. I didn't want to mess up their own lives, you know. Um, so I would watch them eating, but yes. I wouldn't be eating. Because like I say, I didn't take food up into the mountains. But there was a time when we fed them bananas, but I couldn't have eaten a banana with them because they would have rushed over and taken it away. Fascinating. But they were, you know, that early time when I really got to know them, they were almost like family. I knew them so well, watching the infants observe their mothers. That's how they learn the tool using and seeing how, you know, the mother is using a nice long twig to fish for termites. And the infant will watch her then he'll try and grab her, her tool, which she doesn't like. She doesn't punish him because he doesn't understand. She tickles him with one hand and goes on fishing with the other. And then he gets a very inappropriate little tiny tool like that. And of course, that doesn't do any good. But gradually, over the months, he gets better and better. Going back, you, 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 you are chosen to go study these, these chimps. Of the many other people that could be the chosen, there you, you gain your right to be because you were persistent. You, you never seems to can know as as an answer, and, and on paper, you didn't have the experience and or uh, the training. And my question to you is, why do you think this was important? That actually maybe it was all the people that had study for years and years and they had titles and, but the, here you are, uh, and for many reasons, obviously, 
now seeing, uh, going back years, you were the perfect person for it. Well, what's the lesson we all need to learn? Well, I think the lesson is that I decided that I would go and uh, live with animals and write books about them. I was 10 years old at that time, and I had the support of my mother. And I didn't go to university because we couldn't afford it. And so I got a boring old job in London and then got invited to Kenya by a friend. So I saved up money working as a waitress. I got to know all the people down in what we called the Netherlands, the cooks. And I used to sometimes go down to fetch up the food when they were slow. So I had a lot to do with, you know, how people eat in the restaurant. I loved watching them, comparing the way they were feeding with the chimpanzees. And then when I got this letter, I saved up money, I met this famous anthropologist, Louis Leakey, and he chose me for two reasons. Um, and by the way, nobody had studied chimps in the wild at that time, nobody. He chose me, one, because I was a woman, and he felt that women might be more patient. Two, he loved it that I did not have a degree because he said, these scientists studying animals, they, they're so reductionist. And he wanted somebody whose mind was open and who was prepared to watch and learn from the chimpanzees. And it worked. That's it. It actually worked. It worked amazingly well. You open us to a world we didn't know existed. So, 1960s, talking about your food habits and love, you became a vegetarian. So, so tell me what's this moment that you decide, I'm not gonna be eating any more meat and or fish? Meat and fish. Well, when I left England, there were no factory farms. You know, these terrible places where billions of animals are put in, it's like animal concentration camp. And I didn't know about those. And then I read a book by a man called Peter Singer. Um, and it described the conditions in these factory farms. Animal liberation. Animal liberation. And so the next time, there was, I was on a plane when I read this book. And I think it was a piece of, I don't know, a piece of meat that was on the plate. And when I looked at it, I thought, this symbolizes fear, pain, and death. And I didn't want to eat it. And that was the last, I didn't eat it. And I haven't eaten any meat since. At fish a little bit longer, and then, you know, realizing they feel pain too, I decided, no, I can't eat them. And then more recently, learning about the treatment of dairy cows and chickens in these places. I became a vegan, but I'm not a strict vegan. I can't be. I mean, when you're traveling around the world, you first of all, you don't want to upset people who spend ages cooking for you. And I have my mother's early training. You never must up, be rude. You know, you eat what's, what's put before you. Um, but I sort of try. And during the pandemic, it was easy. So my sister's a vegan too. So I'm cooking for you later, and I have an entire vegetarian menu for you. Yeah, Thank but you. We can have people that may say, but animals eat meat. Animals are carnivorous in the wild war. What's the difference? Well, the, di <clears throat> the difference is this, that when it's subsistence, like, you know, you, you eat like you're living out in the wild, and also the way we used to eat, like I say, the chickens were running around in the in the farmyard, the cows and pigs were out in the fields. And it's this factory farming that's made the difference. The fact that these animals are so cruelly treated. And then when you learn more about the way this, uh, this industrial agriculture is harming the land because it's depending on chemical pesticides and, and um, herbicides, poisoning the land, affecting biodiversity, killing the soil. And then with the animals, huge areas to grow the grain to feed them. You know, did, did you know more grain is grown to feed animals than starving people? And that's a, that was a shock to me. And then uh, all these animals are producing methane gas, which is one of the bad greenhouse gases. 
I mean, we all produce it, you know, in our digestion. We hope not to do it in public, but... We are using now grains too to produce fuels. So right now, the way we are using the land is not anymore to feed people, but as you said, also to feed the animals. So many people argue that it's kind of a not very smart way to be feeding humanity. But now also the same farms or the same fields and the same grains are being used to produce fuel, putting, if anything, much more difficulty in, for a lot of people cannot afford food because they're competing yeah, against against the grain for animals and the grain for energy. Uh, your your love for vegetables or your becoming a, a true vegetarian, I mean, this is it's been activism for you. You you this has been part of of who you are. Yeah, uh, I think so. And you know, I tell you, once I became vegetarian, and other people have said the same, I felt so much lighter. And apparently, um, the, the 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 carnivores, the animals who eat meat, they have a short gut because they want to get rid of the meat before it goes bad inside. Whereas the herbivores, the grazers, who eat grass and stuff, they have a long one because they want to get the last bit of goodness out of out of the food. And we've got the long gut. So in other words, this meat, that's why you feel that heavy feeling, or oh, I used to, after eating a lot of meat. I never thought about it. Uh, amazing. Well, yeah. isn't that amazing as you However long you live, you're still learning new things. I learn, I try and learn something new every day. I never thought about that. Yeah, the more, the more you know, the more you know, you know nothing. The more you know that you know. Or very little. Yes. yes. <laughs> or the more you know that you need to learn more. Right. So uh, you've created through your lifetime different programs, but one of them is uh, Roots and Shoots. And, and this program helps young people get involved in course, conservation projects. And, uh, and the question would be, are young people really uh, choosing projects based on food security and conversation these days more and more? Uh, and, uh, and, and can you tell us about one? I, I feel that yes, young people are more conscious about the way they eat. And in part, it's thanks to people like you that bring awareness. So do you see that more young people are really thinking when we talk about conservation, is not only to protect the forests or protect the oceans, but that they are becoming very smart and where they see the way to do this is, tell me what you eat and I'll tell you who you are, that really people are trying to live their lives in the same way they want to see change in the world? Yeah, well, these, these young people, these Roots and Shoots programs, you know, they're in 66 countries now. 66 program. countries, the yeah. program. Wow. And we have members in kindergarten, university, everything in between, and more and more adults forming groups. So basically, they, they choose what to do, and they choose to uh, help people, and they choose to help animals, they choose to help the environment. And we try to bring them together as much as we can, usually virtually. And they, they get to understand much more important than the color of your skin, your culture, your religion, uh, your socioeconomic groups, fact, we're all human beings. So this leads to respect for each other, respect for animals, respect for the environment. And because they choose, I mean, there's one program in Costa Rica, uh, sorry, Puerto Rico. For Puerto Rico, we have very strong roots and shoots. And after Hurricane Maria, uh, the roots and shoots groups all around the U.S. saved up money so that they could send seeds to Puerto Rico. And the person who began Roots and Shoots with me is in Puerto Rico. Wow. And his wife is a really good farmer. So she would take the seeds and with the university group of Roots and Shoots, they'd go around helping people plant food that helped keep them alive. And also in one of the very poorest Native American reservations, there's a, a young couple working there. One of them is native. And they're teaching the people how to grow food. They've got these, you know, these tunnels where you can grow food. And they're also teaching them to grow their own old traditional foods. And so, I mean, this is a sustainable future. 
that's being developed, helping people to be self-sustaining and find out how they can feed themselves. Yeah, well, you, you're doing with Roots and Shoots, it's what obviously many believe in, is that you we have to stop you throwing money at the problem, but investing in solutions. Obviously, very, very often you would argue um, uh, people are hungry, therefore they go fish and they fish anything they catch. They fish the baby fish in the, mang in the mangroves. And they catch so many of the baby fish that before anybody realizes those fishermen, they have nothing else to fish anymore. What you're doing is trying to show that the entire ecosystem you need to think holistically at 360 degrees if you protect that mangrove ecosystem and you give a chance to these fish to grow bigger, etc. All of a sudden, those same fishermen are going to be able to not only feed themselves, but even make a living in the process of fishing. But you have to not only think about feeding yourself, you need to holistically to think about the place you live to maintain the perfect interaction between all the ecosystems, yeah. humans, animals, plants, all of the above. That's right. That's right. It's all one, one interconnected, beautiful, living tapestry, which we're destroying. So you have um, a podcast that is called Hopecast. Uh, and you, you published a book last year called The Book of Hope. So you are a very hopeful woman, a very hopeful person for what is to come. Well, you know, something, hope depends how you think of hope. Some people just think it's wishful thinking. But to me, it's about action. So you agree, Jose, that we're living in pretty dark times right now. But I see us as a species. We're at the mouth of a very, very long, very dark tunnel. And right at the end, there's a star shining. That's hope. But we don't sit at the mouth of the tunnel and wonder when that star will come. No, we have to roll up our sleeves and we have to crawl under, climb over, work our way around all the obstacles that lie between us and the star. And that's, you know, that's poverty because people living in great poverty destroy the environment simply in order to survive. Like you say, they catch the baby fish because otherwise they won't have any food because there's so many human beings on the planet, too many human beings on the planet. And you know, there's what, seven, seven point something billion now, they reckon over 10 billion in 2050. So I don't know what the answer is, but we have to think about it and what's going to happen. So anyway, we have to think about poverty. We have to think about the, the degradation of the land, the destruction of the forest, the pollution of the ocean, um, unsustainable lifestyles. But those are the problems, and many more. The good news is that there's people working on every single problem, every one. But too often they work in their own narrow little, little, uh, you know, tunnel, and. They're not thinking about the whole. So, oh, how wonderful, we've closed down this coal mine. No more emissions going up into the greenhouse gases. Not thinking that they've left people without jobs, who become poor, who destroy the environment in order to survive. So collaboration, cooperation, working together is so terribly important. But my, you know, my reasons for hope, first of all, it's the young people because they are more aware and they are taking action and they are not just thinking about the problems, they're solving them. All over the world, as you're speaking to me, um, there are people in some countries working, planting trees, um, raising money to save the poor, raising money to help in Ukraine, uh, that sort of thing. Um, so my second reason for hope is this intellect, we haven't used it wisely. Uh, many people are not using their brains well. But we have the potential, and science is beginning to come up with, you know, renewable energy and things like that, finally. And then there's the resilience of nature. A place can be destroyed, 
and with time and some help, nature will come back. And it may not be quite the same, but the wildlife will begin to come back and it can once again become beautiful. And then there's the indomitable spirit, the people who tackle problems that seem impossible and won't give up. And you know, Jose, you are one of those people because you tackle problems like when you go to the, go to Puerto Rico after the hurricane and now as you go to Ukraine. What you're doing seems to us impossible, but you can feed all these people, but you're doing it. I'm not doing it. You are organizing the We are doing it. it. All right. Somebody else is doing it. Yes, but you started it. It was your intellect that thought of it, and that's the indomitable you, spirit. You see this building there? It's the, the National Archives. Yes. There is this amazing document of the Foundation of America, which very much every other country can endorse, that, that says, we the people. Yes, I know that. But you know exactly what I mean. Yeah. I won't argue with you. So you you said um, at the beginning, uh, obviously, when you were telling me about the first kind of encounter relationship, when the first chimpanzee, what was his name? David Greybeard. And that's somehow I look a little bit like him. <laughs> so I've seen you speak um, sometimes, and I have to ask you to do this. You you do a greeting on behalf of the chimpanzees. Can, can you do that for me, for us now? And, Yes. And then translate. The, I will the do a greeting, a, a distance you have greeting to. to all of the people who are watching. To all listening. the people are going to be watching or and listening, listening to yes. us in America and around the world. Listening, listening, yes. Well, it goes like this. Translated, me, Jane, hello. <laughs> Love it. Well, uh, listen, I can be obviously here listening to you and learning from you for hours and hours and hours. But um, I'm, I'm so thrilled that you that you gave me the opportunity to have you here in this podcast. I love you. Longer tables. I'm just as happy to be here with you talking to you.